Today's episode of Two Diabetes Talks is sponsored by our friends at Lilly Diabetes. As a leader in diabetes care for over 90 years, Lilly Diabetes provides treatment options and resources for people facing the challenges of diabetes, and they understand the value community and peer-to-peer support plays in diabetes management. This is Two Diabetes Talks, a weekly broadcast of news, interviews, and community chat brought to you by Two Diabetes and the Diabetes Hands Foundation. Never miss an episode by subscribing to the audio podcast in iTunes or head over to twodiabetes.org forward slash talks to see the archive of video interviews. Welcome to another episode of 2D Talks, a talk show where we will be discussing important topics, news, and we'll share diabetes information with you. This episode will be also available in podcast format. Make sure you find us on iTunes under Diabetes Hands Foundation. My name is Mila Ferrer. I'm the director of community for 2diabetes.org and F2 Diabetes, two online communities for those living with diabetes and their, and their family. Today, we will be talking with Dr. Mark Heyman. He's a psychologist. He recently joined as a board member um, on Diabetes Hands Foundation and we are going to be talking about mental health and diabetes. It's a topic that we don't listen enough about it and it's crucial for diabetes management. Welcome Dr. Heyman, how are you? I'm well, thank you Mila. Nice to be here. Thank you for saying um, yes and accepting this invitation um, to talk about these topics. Um, first of all, I know you have been previously in our a guest in our live interviews in the past, but I would like for people that don't know you to get a little bit of background of who you are. So can you tell us a little bit about your diabetes story if you have one? I'd be happy to. Well, I was diagnosed with diabetes um, when I was a senior at UCLA, so back in 1999, um, just about 18 years ago. And, um, you know, I, I got, it was the end of my senior year, of, or sorry, the end of my junior year of college. And I, I got really sick. I think I had the classic symptoms. You know, I was really tired. I was peeing a lot. I was so thirsty. And um, I knew something was wrong, but I didn't want to go to the, go to the doctor because I was uh, I had a trip planned to Paris for the summer. It was a dream come true. I was going to go be an intern in Paris. And I was so nervous that if I actually went to the doctor, the doctor would tell me that I couldn't go to Paris. And so I put off going to the doctor for as long as possible. Um, Finally, um, I just couldn't do it anymore. I was, I was trying to walk to class and I just couldn't make it. And I finally gave in and went to the doctor. And I remember that the doctor in the student health center tested my blood sugar and it said hi on the, on, on the meter. And I was like, oh, well, high, medium, low. I'm just kind of high. And he, he freaked out. He shoved me in the chair and he's looking through the, the, through the manual trying to figure out what high means try to figure out what high means. And um, I'm not sure they'd ever seen anybody like that in the, their clinic before. Anyway, suffice to say, they ended up calling an ambulance, which was really embarrassing because at UCLA, the student health center is on one side of the quad and you, there's no car access. And so in order to get to, from the, the health center to the ambulance, they actually had to wheel me on a gurney across this like big quad with everybody. It's, you know, it was really crowded that day. Um, and so I, I was humiliated. Anyway, I made it to the hospital, and um, I don't even remember anyone actually telling me that I had diabetes. I kind of knew because I this was the very the very early stages of Google, and so I was able to Google the symptoms. Um, but anyway, they actually ended up releasing me from the hospital that night. I was never actually admitted, um, and the next day I went to I had an appointment with the doctor, and I was very very lucky that my doctor at that time was Ann Peters, who um, I'm sure many of you know. And I said to her, so I'm planning on going to Paris in three weeks. And she's like, oh, no problem. You can totally do that. Um, so I did. I, I, three weeks after my diagnosis, I uh, flew to France. And I had, looking back on it, I realized I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but I, I made it back alive. And I was in, in communication with Dr. Peters on a regular basis, emailing her my blood sugars and adjusting my insulin doses and you know, I kind of, I got, I kind of got thrown in, but I feel very blessed in that way because it really kind of, it really kind of gave me that proof that you can do anything with diabetes. It doesn't have to stop you from doing, doing much at all or doing anything at all. And, um, you know, I, I feel like I, and I hope to live my life since then kind of with that attitude. So you do have a personal relationship with diabetes and type, type one diabetes in this case. Yeah. Um, were you studying to become a psychologist at that time or did your diagnosis made you like chose that path 
specifically? So, no, I was not studying to be a psychologist. I was actually a political science major. So my undergraduate degree is in political science. And after I finished school, um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I really didn't. Um, so I um, got a job that I didn't, that I didn't like very much, uh, working for a consulting firm. And I started volunteering for a crisis hotline because I wanted to get, get involved with my community. So I started doing that, and I realized that I really enjoyed it. And um, I decided that I wanted to become a psychologist. Um, and then I realized that I, I was just kind of curious as to what sort of mental health issues that people with diabetes face. And I did some research and found out there wasn't really a whole lot of information out there. There was a little bit, but not much. Um, and so I decided that's what I wanted to do. Um, and so I went down that path and I um, got my master's degree. Getting into a PhD program in, in psychology, especially without a psychology degree, is um, really challenging. So I got my master's first. Um, and I wrote my thesis in my master's degree about e eating disorders and diabetes, um, looking to see if there's a relationship between insulin pump use and eating disorders. Um, and then after that, I got my PhD in clinical psychology with a specialization in health psychology. Um, you know, at the time that I went to school, and even now, there weren't a whole lot of uh, people who were doing research in, in diabetes. And so I kind of had to pave my own path. Um, my advisor was a researcher in um, dialysis. And so there was, a, there was a connection there, but not a real strong one. But I was able to, to write my dissertation on um, type 2 diabetes and uh, perception of risk in people with type 2 diabetes, looking to see if, if there's a relationship between perception of risk of developing complications and um, treatment outcome. And uh, we found that there was. And so then I kind of went, went on that path. Um, and, you know, have been doing that to some degree ever, ever since. I haven't always been focusing on diabetes. I took a little bit of a detour and did some work with PTSD and with other um, issues related to trauma, which I, felt, which I found was really great clinical training. So now I feel that I use those skills a lot um, now, even though my work really focuses only on people with diabetes. Awesome. So diabetes changed your life in, in many different ways, um, not only in the way you live in your health, but also in, in your job experience. I, tell so, you. I, I mentioned that you recently joined the Diabetes Hands Foundation board um, as a mm -hmm. member. Um, what do you, I was very excited, I have to, to tell you. Um, we met you last year for Master Lab. Um, I know we have a lot of things in common because we believe that, as we mentioned before, mental health, it's something that it's not, spoken every day like you you know you you do listen a lot about complications new medications but that mental part it's like behind a, a big curtain mm -hmm. and we want to make sure that people understand that it, it plays a, a key uh, role in the diabetes management so what do you plan what can you bring to the organization how can you help us keep helping our members and bring more members and maybe give them some light if they are at the point that they are probably saying, hey, I think I need some mental health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think that the, you know, my, the way I think about mental health is really broad. And so certainly there are some people with diabetes that have um, some serious mental health conditions that are related to, to, that, to diabetes. But I would say that, the, you know, the majority of people with diabetes really what they really need um, to help them kind of cope and to, to get through the tough times is support. Um, I think that's really one of the biggest thing, one, of the, one of the biggest predictors of success is how much support you have. And that's really the goal of the Diabetes Hands Foundation is to provide support and to, provide, to let people know that they're not alone in, in, this, um, in this world with diabetes. And so I'm excited to join the board because really it kind of you know, allows me to help, help with that mission. Um, you know, I really hope to bring um, my expertise and my um, my passion for this uh, for this topic, both in the type one world, but also in the type two world. Mm -hmm. I think that you know, I think there's a, lo a lot of need, and you know, there's a lot of a lot a lot of times the mental health needs of people type two are are not as prominent as they are in type one, although they, they still are there. And so, to be able to provide that sort of expertise and support and guidance for the organization. In both for both people with type one and type two, I think is going to be really exciting. Um, my hope is that over the next couple of years, I can really work with the uh, Diabetes Hands Foundation to uh, develop programs and to really kind of really flesh out some of their materials and some of their content um, on mental health, um, and maybe even you know 
you know, I, I, I don't want to speak out of turn here, but, you know, perhaps have a master lab or some sort of, or, you know, meeting around mental health where, where advocates can come and talk about what they're doing in their communities to really improve the mental health of their uh, of people with diabetes, whether they're um, professionals, mental health professionals, or whether they're, you know, people who are just advocates and writing blogs and really um, providing that support on the ground level. Um, it's a really exciting time, and I'm, I'm really excited to be part of the organization right now. Ooh, I'm looking forward for those new projects because I know <laughs> we have so much to do. So yeah. let's, let's talk a bit about mental health in specific. Um, in general, not only people with diabetes, mental health is overlooked in general. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why we as a society that we know that we all have problems, we have issues, and by maybe talking to someone or seeking help, it's the best way for us to stay grounded and to stay in track. Why is it so difficult for humans to say, hey, I have a problem. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not feeling good about me, myself, or something. Yeah, well, I think there are a couple reasons. And first, I, the first one you brought up is that it's just really hard to ask for help. I, I certainly have a hard time asking for help myself um, a lot of times when I need it. But you know, asking for help is hard. Um, and it's, it's especially hard around mental health issues for, I think, a couple of reasons. Uh, the first one is very similar to diabetes. That there's, a lot, there's a lot of stigma around mental health. We don't really, people have a perception of people who have who are asking for help or or if, if they feel that they're asking for help, that, that that people will look at them differently, or that they'll, there's a perception that there's something wrong with them, and um, so that that's that's a really big challenge. The other part, the other thing is that you know sometimes mental health challenges aren't necessarily people don't recognize them right away um, that they that they're experiencing something something that's going on. Sometimes these things come on uh, very slow, <clears throat> excuse me, very slowly and incrementally. And they don't notice the changes of themselves. Maybe they're, you know, staying in bed a little bit longer in the morning because they're uh, they're feeling a little bit down, or they're eating too much at night you know, because they're trying to, um, you know, better. And those and those things change over time, but not necessarily in a way that are that's going to be, you know, really dramatic. And they may take, you know, a, fam a friend or family member saying, you know, hey, you've really changed. You don't you don't, think, look, don't don't look like you're doing very well to be able to recognize that. Um, you know, and, and also sometimes, you know, it's really easy to say my head hurts or my stomach hurts or there's something physically wrong with me. And you can go to the doctor and you can say that. Um, sometimes mental health issues are a little bit more vague. It's harder to really actually put the words to what it is that you're experiencing. And for people, that can be really challenging. You know, I have patients come to me, you know, and they say, I'm just not feeling well. And they have a really hard time explaining what that means. Um, and so, when, when you can't explain something, you don't have words for it, you can e more easily write it off as being not really a problem or not something that I really want to need to get help for because I don't really feel like it's a big deal. Um, even though we know that it is and we know that you know, help, keep, you know, getting help can be really helpful. Um, it can make you feel better. It can, give you, it can empower you to, um, to do things that you're not able to do right now. You just mentioned that sometimes it takes for a friend of, or a family member to notice that something's going on. But how mm -hmm. can us or can, can me as a friend of, or, or a family member, how can I suggest that loved one that, hey, maybe you need help without like hurting their feelings? Because sometimes I'm pretty sure a lot of people do notice something, but they don't know how to say it. They don't know how to say, hey, honey, I think you need help. I, I, I think you're you look sad, you look down, like, mm -hmm. should we find some help? How do we say that to our love member without bringing, like, more, like, issues and, and making them more aware that, oh, there's something really wrong going on right now? Sure. Well, I think doing it in a really supportive and um, non-confrontational way is really important. You go to someone and say, you need help right now. You know, the first, your first reaction is going to be defensive. But coming at it from a point of caring about them, and you know, just noticing noticing that, and you know, noticing what they're experiencing, and really recognizing that can be really helpful. And it depends. It, it really depends on the person. But for some people, that the fact that somebody notices no, is noticing that they're struggling when maybe they haven't recognized it themselves, or they've been recognizing it, but they're they've been hiding it from other people, um, can be a big burden off of them. And so um, that can be really helpful. Also, I think that 
the response the person gives you, you know, one, it tells you a lot about kind of where they are, where they're at. You know, if some, if you say, I think you need help and they get really, de really defensive about it, um, and about, you know, how they're coping and how they're, how they're doing. But also I think that it's, you know, we, we always like to, we always as humans like to see success in immediate terms that, you know, I, I say you need some help and you say, okay, I'm going to call tomorrow and get an appointment. And then on Tuesday, on Thursday, you go to the appointment and then on Friday, you're, you're all done. And with mental health issues, that doesn't really, um, it doesn't really work that way. Um, you know, it's a longer process, but also, and part of that process is actually getting the person to, uh, you know, see if they need help. And so sometimes you, you may plant the seed now and that seed may come back in a month or two months or even a year. And they say, yeah, you know, I, I think I'm finally ready for help. Because the thing about mental health issues is getting, getting treatment isn't going to be helpful unless you recognize and you're motivated to change. Um, unlike taking a pill for um, high blood pressure or even, even insulin for diabetes, um, mental health treatment takes, takes some hard work and it takes some behavior change and takes some, takes some maybe getting in touch with some uncomfortable feelings, which can be really challenging. And so giving people time to really see that, um, that they need that and, and time to be, be ready for that, pro that change process um, is really important. Oh, the, the human is so complex, but at the same time, it's, we need, I think we all should go to a psychologist, like everyone should go. We all have <laughs> some issues. <laughs> yeah. So Mark, how does um, mental health affects a person living with diabetes? Like we know that a person that it's depressed, um, it can just, it, it, can, it can say, hey, I'm not going to deal with my diabetes management today. A person with type 1, that could be very dangerous. A person with type 2 over time, that could lead to more dangerous th things too. But how does, that, does it affect them? For example, we are living in, in very uncertain times. Um, mm -hmm. Economy, health insurance. There are so many factors that can start making holes in, in your brain. <laughs> and, and you are like do I have like a choice? Is there like something that I can do to help me stay afloat, manage my diabetes, stay strong, health, mentally health and, and physically? How mm -hmm. do a person with diabetes deals with all these things that are happening? Yeah. So I think that to answer a question about how, how do you deal with kind of being overwhelmed, whether it's about, or whether it's about diabetes or whether it's about the, what's happening in the world, um, is I think I think the first step is really not, is taking small steps. Um, sometimes we feel like we have to take it on all at once, and you take on everything. So I have to if I if I'm diagnosed with type two diabetes, all of a sudden I have to change my entire diet. I have to start exercising on a. I have to start running marathons every day. I have to, um, you know, do all all, the, all these things differently. And what we actually know is that you know small changes really help, are manageable. Um, they're not, they're they're less overwhelming. And they give you a sense that you can actually do it. That you can actually you can actually make changes that are going to be helpful for you. Um, I think the same thing holds true for things that aren't diabetes that are, that are not diabetes related. So you know you're you're looking at health insurance, we're looking at the economy, and you know everything else going on in the world. That burden on all of, all ourselves, and you know sometimes it's good to take a step back and, and say what what is it that I can influence in my life today, or even in the next hour or the next minute and work, work on those small things as opposed to kind of have, let, let it them be really large. And certainly mental health issues have a, have a big impact on diabetes management. You know, if, if you're feeling depressed or you're feeling anxious or you're feeling any kind of negative emotion, it's going to be really hard to manage diabetes in addition to that. It becomes, it becomes all that much more of a burden on the, on the, other side of it, if you're feeling positive emotions, excitement and joy and uh, whatnot, it can be maybe maybe it can be easier to feel the, to to manage diabetes because it kind of it's less burdensome. But certainly, um, you know, looking at it from from those perspectives can be really helpful. But really, you know, what can I do today, or what can I do in the next hour or the next minute to make myself feel better, to make my life better, to make my, my to make me feel like I'm more in control of what's happening to me. Um, is really important. And what signs can a person with diabetes present that are alerts that some mental health issue is under 
like under all their daily work and because we have been mm -hmm. for example i have been reading lately about um high functioning depression this is mm -hmm. this is people that you look at them they seem to be okay but in the inside in the background they're like struggling like how mm -hmm. can we identify if we have a friend with diabetes a family member with diabetes that something might be going on there right so if i would say that if you see their their man their diabetes management change significantly so even if you just see a, a change in a1c if someone has an a1c of seven percent and then you know three months later they go into the doctor and their a1c is nine percent that's certainly a big sign that that something is not go, that, that something may be off there that they may that they may be struggling in some way. Um, if you see people gain weight, if you see people eating behavior change, if they someone was exercising a lot but now they're not, not exercising much at all, um, those are certainly signs that certainly not not a definite sign that something's wrong, but some, you know some some red flags that you may you may notice. I think it's also important to differentiate if we can. Uh, so we have, there's there's kind of two two boats here, right? You have people who have diabetes, and they're also struggling with some other mental health condition. So you know, I, I have diabetes, and then, you know, I have depression. You know, or sometimes or sometimes I feel depressed, and those two things are not, aren't connected at all. But certainly they influence each other. You know, if if someone is depressed, harder for them to manage their diabetes. On the other hand you have people who have mental health conditions that are directly related to diabetes. So for example, um, you know, diabetes burnout, even though that's, that's not a, a, a clinical diagnosis that we can give somebody, um, that's you know, feeling overwhelmed by the burdens of living with diabetes on a daily basis and then deciding to kind of give up at least for a time, if not forever. Um, and those are, you know, we can notice, you know, is behavioral condition related to Diabetes itself, or is it, or are they separate issues, and do they, are they influencing, are diabetes and their their challenge influencing each other? So I think that you know noticing those things. Um, but for example, one of the things I deal with a lot in my work with patients is fear of hypoglycemia. Um, you know, scared of have having low blood sugars, and so they keep the blood sugar artificially high. You know, they're, instead of, you know, trying to keep the blood sugar between me, they have a fear of going below 180, and so they always try to keep their blood sugar above 180. Um, and so you see kind of these, you, you, that's when the uh, blood sugar control becomes much more obvious that someone may be having a challenge with um, with a diabetes related mental health issue because the blood sugar is, you know, is very out of control um, on the high end, one is our eating eating disorders um, with that in diabetes. So someone not taking insulin or going to DKA on a regular basis because they're not taking insulin um, in order to lose weight. Those are certainly things that are um, you know can, can be some big warning signs. Yeah, there's um, you just answered my my other question. What were some of the most common mental health issues a person with diabetes would would have? But yeah, so we already know we have we need some help. We need to go somewhere. We need to talk to someone. Mm -hmm. Who is that person? What specialist should I look for? Because I understand, for example, you would be a a great candidate because you're a psychologist. You live with type mm -hmm. one diabetes, but would me as a person with type 1 diabetes or with diabetes, would mm -hmm. I have the same sort of relationship or, or my psychologist would understand me if he doesn't live with diabetes or type 1 diabetes or like, yeah, would yeah. it be the same? Because um, I, I think I know you understand the struggles like, hey. Yeah. I, I think and that's a big challenge that we have, but I think, I think that really depends on a couple of things. It depends on, one is what's the person's, what, what, what's the main reason for the person's challenge? And, and while we don't need to kind of get back and like understand like where did it, where did it start and why is it happening, um, if a person is depressed, let's just kind of use that as, a, as an example. If someone's experiencing depression, it's nothing to do with diabetes, then um, in, in my experience, they, they, if they, and they want to seek help, you know, seeing seeing a, a, a psychologist or a therapist um, who doesn't know much about diabetes um, usually works out pretty well um, because they're you're able to you're able to treat the treat the depression and um, you know hopefully diabetes management comes into that process a little bit. But the person the therapist doesn't really require much education. 
they don't really need to understand diabetes and the nuances of diabetes in order to treat somebody really effectively in that way. Um, on the on the flip side of that, there are people who have um, diabetes specific concerns, and if the person if the person that they're seeing doesn't really have an uh, understanding or familiarity with those diabetes specific concerns, it can be really challenging because what it means is that the person with diabetes is going to spend a lot of time educating their psychologist or their therapist and taking up a lot of time and taking up a lot of energy, and the person may not actually understand or really be able to under really be able to really fully grasp. Um, what the per what the challenges the person's having are. In those cases, um, it's a lot more important that the per person that they're seeing not um, understands diabetes. They certainly don't need to live with diabetes, um, but that's not a requirement at all. There are a lot of psychologists out there who really understand diabetes, who don't live with it, don't have it in their family, don't live with it themselves, but they've spent the time and taken the energy to actually to learn and to get the experience. Um, so I, I and. And then there are some people who are seeing somebody who gets it. Their issue may not be related to diabetes at all, but they just like but they like knowing that um, that I understand what, where they're coming from uh, because it kind of has there's a kind of this un, unspoken just understanding about you know kind of what you're living with on a daily basis. I think it's really important to note though that. The majority of people with diabetes, and even the majority of people, or a lot of people who are struggling with emotions around diabetes, don't necessarily need to see a therapist. They're, they're not, you know, I, I think that there are a lot of resources in our community that aren't professional mental health, mental health help that people can really, um, you know, online support communities, whether it's to diabetes or whether they're Facebook groups or whether they're blogs that people are reading. Um, in-person meetups where they're able to get support and know that they're not alone in what they're experiencing um, can be really helpful. Having friends and family to talk to, um, having you know just coping skills to be able that they can use to you know make themselves feel better um, for a lot of people is is really really helpful. And, and professional help isn't necessarily um, indicated. Certainly, if people want it; they can. They, they they're certainly welcome to to seek it. And certainly, there are some conditions where it would be it's. Um, it, advisable to seek mental health treatment, but um, I don't want to send the message to anybody that if you have diabetes, you automatically need to see a therapist. That you need to see need, need to seek mental health treatment, uh, because that's not true at all. I think that there's you know a, a severity that people go through in terms of their their condition, and I would say that most people with diabetes, you know, to some degree on a, on a regular basis, feel negative emotions, frustration, anger. Um, people they feel overwhelmed, kind of those negative emotions. Um, and you know, going moving into things like burnout, and then moving into more serious conditions, which really impact your quality of life, but also impact your health. You know, things like you know, you know, fear of hypoglycemia is, is a good example of that. So you're running your blood sugar high because you're scared of going low, and um, that would be probably an example where seeking treatment would be um, advantageous because um, not only are you not able to do things that you enjoy in your life, but you're also putting yourself at risk of developing complications, and so it's kind of a double. A double-edged sword there so every time we feel that our mental health is interfering with our life or diabetes mm -hmm. management it's where you would suggest a person would seek some help right yeah so I, I would say that if it's impacting your ability to function in the world so you do your job go to school um, be a good friend spouse w whatever that is um, it, I think that that's an important time to get some help as well and or if if it's impacting your ability to take care of yourself well. Either that's because either either because you're ignoring diabetes and not wanting to deal, to deal with it, or you have some sort of fear or anxiety around um, good management. Th those are good reasons to seek help. Um, but I'm, I'm, and on on the same note, support. Everyone needs um, everyone needs a friend, and certainly. Um, some of the coolest people I know have diabetes, so I, you know, for for me, I I, I have a lot of friends with diabetes, and I lean on them for support, um, and that's you know that's what I need. Um, but I think it really depends on the person and what it is that they need and what they're looking for and what's to be, what's going to be most helpful for them. And that's exactly what we as Diabetes Science Foundation want to provide. We want to make sure that hey, if you were diagnosed with type one diabetes, type two diabetes, you're not alone. You're not the only person. Um, 
usually uh, when you are diagnosed or your family member is diagnosed, the first thing you start to look in your brain is who else that I know lives with this condition that I can mm -hmm. seek out, that I can talk to, that I can learn from it. So that's why we mm -hmm. have these two online communities that are peer-to-peer -peer support because we understand that we are all walking in very similar paths and maybe and we can definitely help each other during this this complicated um, trap mm -hmm. times and, and, and paths that we go through. So yeah. Dr. Hyman, can you please tell us some tips like what and, and this could be general because I think we all, every single human in the universe needs to be mm -hmm. healthy mentally. Um, yeah. Some tips to stay mentally health um, during these times? Yeah, of course. Um, so I think the first is to you know seek support to you know to find people that you that you care about and who you trust um, and get support whether that means going out and having dinner with them or talking to them about, about the things that are challenging for you or just you know just being with them and knowing that knowing that you're not alone is the, is the first thing I would say. Um, the second thing is it's important to you know really set your expectations well about especially about diabetes management. You know, I think that we that some people have a vision that if they're not, if their A1C is not six point five, or if their blood sugars are ever over one hundred and fifty, that they're they're somehow a failure. And um, that's while, while you know keeping blood sugar your blood sugar in, in good in a, in a good target range is really helpful. Um, there's more to life than that, and to set to feel you have to be perfect all the time in your diabetes management is impossible. If you do that, you're setting yourself up for failure because. It's never positive. I mean, you can you can work really really hard, but we all know that everyone who lives with diabetes knows that some days you know, nothing you can do to get to keep that blood sugar down or to keep it up for that matter. And so, expectations and giving yourself some flexibility and what um, what diabetes well, what that looks like, I, I think is really important. Um, and also, you know, taking small steps. It's, I, as, I, as I said before, earlier in this interview, it's really easy to get really overwhelmed, whether it's a, around school or work or life or diabetes. And um, you know, but, you know, progress progress sometimes comes in small steps. And figuring out what you, don't don't feel like you have to do it all today. That you can do it over time, and that you can do that. You're able to see that. Hard. I, I don't. And I don't mean to say diabetes isn't hard, but like that. But you know, I have a list of things I need to do today. I feel, think it's reasonable. I'm going to go ahead and do that, and then I'm going to take some time and relax. And I think that's that's the that's the last thing I want to say is you know taking time for yourself and relaxing, de finding ways to decompress. Whether that's by reading a book or watching a movie or um, cooking dinner, whatever it is that relaxes you is, is always really important, so that you can be fresh and be feel like you're um, you have a balance in your life, which is a really an important part of um, being healthy mentally. Thank you for these amazing tips that I think we all need to put in, in into into practice. Um, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for teaching us how to identify what some mental health issues can be, how to be proactive, how to take care of ourselves. And thank you for joining the board member. As a board member, I'm looking forward, as I, as I said, to work and create some more programs and initiatives to support uh, the mental health of people living with diabetes and their loved ones. Thank you so much. So we have come to the end of this uh, episode of two diabetes talks, two detox. Don't forget diabetes has two online communities that provide support as Dr. Heyman mentioned for those living with diabetes and their family members. And it's all free of cost. That's very important. You can find us in Espanol in estudiabetes.org or in English in todiabetes.org. If you want to suggest a topic for an interview, let us know. Send me an email, mila at diabeteshf.org. Um, share this information with your family and friends, and don't forget to download our podcast. Look for us on iTunes as under Diabetes and Foundations or to Detox. So see you in our next interview. Have a great and healthy week. Bye, Dr. Heyman. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, Mila.